Hi everyone. Um, it's good to see you after, I think it's been a year or two. Um, looking forward to the conversation and learning from all of us as we move. And hi God, <laughs> I miss our gym session. <laughs> Okay, thanks. And Paul and I are going to do a bit of a tag team here as we work through the conversation, uh, taking uh, taking uh, turns, uh, either speaking or facilitating or whatever. So, uh, all right, next uh, next slide, please, Eileen. All right. So, as uh, as we said, we've got Gord Cunningham uh, on the uh, on the line. Uh, so, Gord, why don't you say a few words to uh, the class of twenty eighteen? Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to see you all and hear you. I'm, I was great to hear your voice, Bo. I miss those morning gym sessions, too, because the gym is closed at St. Avex. The entire campus is in lockdown and has been for six weeks. So, uh, Salim, we are not looking better. Uh, if I was to pan the camera down, you would see that the weight gain has been substantial. Uh, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing your voices. Uh, as Anthony said, this is the, the uh, I think the third or fourth uh, session that we've ha held this way. I really want to credit my colleagues, uh, Anthony and, and all the others who have, uh, Eileen who's on the call, uh, Yogesh, um, uh, Julian, others who have stepped up and are have either already held sessions with thematic groups, uh, over the years with women's leadership, with country-based. We've had one in Nepal. I know there's one planned later this week for Ethiopian graduates and one uh, for Ghanaian graduates. So really, really pleased. It's a great way for us to keep connected, for us to learn more about each other's situations. And, uh, you know, for us to really gather uh, much more intelligence about what is really happening on the ground, what what is the situation people are facing and how can we how can we take that knowledge that we gain from these conversations to adjust our courses and our programs to be more relevant for a post-COVID world, which eventually will come and will be a great challenge for many of us. Um, so as Anthony said, I'll just end by saying that uh, you are still the reigning diploma group. We did not have one last year for the first time in 60 years. And it's very fitting that we're having this, this webinar today because this is when the new design, newly designed diploma for 2020 was supposed to be in its online phase. Uh, the residency phase was supposed to start in a couple of weeks. And again, that has been postponed because of COVID. So it's going to be, you'll be the reigning diploma grads for two full years. First time ever that we've had a group that has held the crown for that length of time. So you're, you're still very, very close to our hearts. Um, we all remember you and it's gonna be so great to hear your voices in a few minutes. So thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Paul. Great. Okay, thank you, Gord. All right, Paul, over to you. Uh, thank you, God, and uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us. And I think um, our conversation today is um, uh, in a time of a pandemic, um, Koji alumni and their organizations are looking for and finding ways to support communities of the vulnerable and disadvantaged to respond to a crisis. We are all, um, I think we're all responding to the situation differently in, in our own rights and responsibilities. And today's conversation is an opportunity for the diploma grads of 2018 to convene, uh, share ideas, experiences, questions, challenges, um, and lessons on how uh, COVID-19 pandemic is, is impacting our different communities and organizations and how we are responding differently. When we're at code, we're all sharing how the, um, the great work that we're all doing. And then I think we also still want to continue that conversation and learn from the great work that we're still doing currently during this pandemic. Um, next slide. Thank you. <clears throat> Right, so we see basically two, uh, we think of structuring the conversation around uh, two key questions. So the first one is kind of like the stock taking one. So how is COVID-19 um, impacting your communities and your organizations? So what's, what's the situation? What's the impact? 
and do a do an open round uh, around that question and then secondly then getting into the response part of the uh, of the thing so given that that impact so what has been our uh, response so um, those are the two questions and the way we thought we'd structure the conversation would be just to um, put them out on the table and then invite people to uh, to speak to the different questions so we're now going to go out of the sort of webinar mode um, and if you remember the scene they're in the big classroom and open the um, open the floor uh, for questions in terms of how is the pandemic impacting your community and organization. So uh, Eileen, can we now go into the, the meeting mode or whatever, or just? Um... We are already in it, so people. Um... Okay, so we don't have to share the screen. Can we, can we, can we? Oh, uh... I'm sorry, I'll take the screen off, just one second. There. Okay. Okay. Got better, everybody. Can... Okay. Yeah. All right. And I believe uh, Mpo is going to facilitate this session here. But really what we're asking here is just simply, so what has been the impact? I mean, I'll, I'll lead off with the example of, um, of Andy Ganesh and, and the Cody Institute. Um, from our perspective, it's been about uh, six weeks since um, uh, there was a, uh, the government uh, and the communities uh, acknowledged that the situation was deteriorating um, uh, quite badly. And so everyone went into uh, basically a lockdown or social isolation, social distancing mode. Uh, the university uh, was still in full term with the regular students. Uh, that was uh, shut down. All the students were sent home. Um, and, um, and the university switched over within a week to uh, online learning. Uh, uh, from our point of view at Cody, Everybody was sent home. Um, uh, that we had staff overseas who had to be brought back through from some fairly complicated processes, and they all had to go into isolation for two weeks. And, um, we've uh, they're <clears throat> they're all well, they're all healthy. There wasn't anybody directly impacted, um, and then we had to make some quick decisions, which involved the canceling of our summer program, which involved the new diploma program, uh, the GCL, the Global Change Leaders Women's Program and a series of certificates. And so they, the, a couple of courses were canceled and the rest were pushed back to the fall. And we're coming up to the issue now of uh, deciding whether we can go ahead or not with the fall program. So that's from our point of view. I'd like to, uh, I, I, in, in, in Nova Scotia was actually the last province in Canada to start to have cases of um, COVID-19. Um, and it's, um, it's, we've been able to flatten the curve fairly well in terms of numbers, but uh, it has gotten into uh, some of the seniors' residents, and there have been a series of, um, of uh, fatalities there. Um, of course, many of you will have heard, of course, over the past uh, couple of weeks that we had a terrible shooting here as well, uh, which was really quite stressful and, and distressing for the, the community at large. Um, and, you know, there is some indication that that was tied to uh, issues of, of gender-based or domestic violence as the root of it and, and all that. So it's been a, a difficult and distressing time, but um, uh, we're coping as best we can. So that's that's from me on behalf of the Cody. Well, let's go over there around the, do we want to, people want to volunteer, put up your hand, or do you want to just uh, jump into the conversation? Um, all right. Thank you so much, Anthony, for, for sharing. I think we could uh, go about with volunteering at first so that we get um, those that are interested to share and then if there are a few hands and then we might try and probe so that we get conversations from, from everyone if that's okay. So anyone who would like to share uh, how they've been impacted. I'll also look at the, the chat feed if anyone has <coughs> yeah, say, shared something on that side. Um, let me start. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, well, it's nice to see you all colleagues. Uh, basically, after mid uh, last year, I have moved to Bangladesh. And as you know, Bangladesh is uh, you know most dense, densely you know populated country. And we have got a huge number of Rohingya refugees. So what uh, and I, we have been in a lockdown in the room in i mean sitting in the apartment and trying to hear the office uh, i work for unfp again in bangladesh so as of today uh, more than six seven thousand people have been infected with the virus and about 
160 people have died. And today we got to know that one of our colleagues also got infected. So that's a ring here. <clears throat> so what I am doing here is, you know, uh, trying to reprogram all so most of the activities towards uh, COVID response for communities to access uh, sexual and reproductive health services. And we are also trying to mobilize new resources from different, different donors uh, towards uh, COVID response. We are trying hard to uh, get the you know, PPE, PPEs from different sources. And uh, so, yeah, basically, you know, we are trying to adjust ourselves to protect our, the health service uh, providers. Especially, uh, we have got a large number of midwives, mobilized midwives in our communities. So we want uh, them to be protected first and also uh, help them to go to you know, homes and provide information and services to women who are pregnant or who need services because they have not been able to uh, come out uh, because of the sociocultural reasons and other different factors. So that's all from my side. Um, thank you so much, Haim. Um, the next person, could we keep it on um, the impact? Because uh, Anthony is going to do a session on, on the responses. Um, anyone else to share their impact? Um, hi, everyone. OK, from my end, can you hear me? OK. So from um, Nigeria, from my end, over the past one month, we have been locked down. For, um, for me, I work through an organization that work through religious leaders to reach our community. So um, along the line, what we decided to do was to see, I know you should have, okay, as of yesterday night, we have a confirmed cases of 1,532 cases in Nigeria. Um, among them, 255 have been discharged as of yesterday night by 11.50 when the results came out. Then we have just had um, 44 deaths so far. So what we decided to do as an organization, I know along the line you've seen a lot of videos coming up from Nigeria where people are beginning to say that um, they don't um, they they don't believe that there is issues around COVID, uh, there's COVID nineteen. Um, people are tend to not believe because at first when we started having the case of um, convert in Nigeria, it was um, mainly among the politicians, the rich, in quotes. So a lot of people started saying it was the rich man sickness, not for the poor men. But after then, we're beginning to see that a lot of people also have been um, infected. So it's no longer for the rich alone. It's for everybody, COVID, everybody, anybody and everybody can get infected. So, but from the community and from the faith communities that we are working, we've seen a lot of videos when we go out to see and people say they don't believe it exists. God will not allow it to affect them and they, they just, come from that denier angle. So what we decided to do as an organization, to walk through influential religious leaders, so we, um, we really could not do much than to go through use social media. So presently, what we are doing is to, we, we are working with religious leaders to develop messages of hope and messages of prevention. So the religious leaders, we have some short clips that are already edited. Hello. So we have some short clips that are already edited, but we have messages um, that develop that religious leaders needed to speak out to let the community know that this is real. People should take preventive measures and all that. So along the line, presently, um, some videos, some short videos where influential religious leaders are coming out to um, speak about COVID-19 and how people should prevent their health, how they should stay at home and how they should observe the social distance um, are on the pipeline, which is going to come out before the end of this week. So that's how we decided to start from our end 
to start um, um, our own response using religious leaders because we know that everybody in the community believe, belongs to one faith congregation or the other and people have um, respect and listen to what their religious leaders are saying. So we are in turn using religious leaders to go back to them to spread the messages of prevention and also messages of hope for those who are already infected or who have lost their loved ones along the line. So presently, that is what we are doing from my end. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, anyone else who would like to share? So I'm, I'm realizing that we are sharing both the impact and response, uh, res, uh, the responses, which is fine. So me and um, Anthony, we're going to shift because it was the next session, but we're going to core shift uh, so that we maintain the conversation. So anyone else want to share? On, so it's fine. You can just share the impact and responsibilities uh, responses since we're already doing that. Um, Asifa, yeah. Oh, okay. Hello, uh, everybody. Is that me? Hello. We can hear you. That's great. You have to unmute your mic. It's still muted. Uh, Seifa, you have to unmute the mic now. You muted it again. Okay. okay. These Hello. are the four most commonly used words in the in the Zoom era. You yeah. are still muted. No, I have a, I muted it. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I will I will try. I mean, to say uh, something about uh, the impact of COVID nineteen at organization level and at country level. Uh, so first, let, let, let me mention some factors. Uh, as of uh, yesterday, I don't have uh, two days uh, data. We have uh, 126 cases countrywide, three days and 50 totally recovered from uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, when I can, I may jump uh, to the impact uh, it has uh, passed more than one month. The schools, uh, universities has closed and uh, the government has uh, declared a state of uh, emergency, which is uh, very, very uh, controversial because it has a political uh, impact on the, on the other side. And this state of emergency has faced a lot of oppositions from opposition uh, political parties. So under this uh, state of emergency, uh, the government try to justify it because before the state of uh, emergency, some guidelines which were passed by the Minister of Health were not respected. So uh, the government was forced to, to, to bring this, I mean, declare this state of emergency. And as a result of, uh, I mean, before this state of emergency, the Ethiopian Electoral Board has postponed the general election, which was planned to be conducted at the end of uh, the coming uh, August. And the other impact was unemployment has increased uh, very much uh, because uh, some big factories were closed because of uh, this uh, uh, COVID. And the other, when I come to organizational impact, well, uh, impact will have been uh, discussing with some donors to get some, uh, some, some resources. After the coming of this COVID-19, uh, some donors pulled back from uh, the, the negotiation. But, uh, but uh, interestingly, uh, some, some donors which, are, which have been working and still uh, which are working with us has tried to, I mean, are trying to allot additional budgets to fight this COVID-19. This is what I have as far as the impact is concerned. All right, Salim, you can go. Okay. Morning, everyone. Great to see those faces. Trying to figure out how God is in front by Moses Cody's statue there. Uh, I want to know if he has that on his screen, saving some room or something. 
<laughs> Good to see you all. Um, well, since my return from Cody, I've been engaged um, not so much on community development issues, but focused on the national level in response to disaster and hazard impacts. So I've been working out of the National Disaster Office. So much of what I have to say is at a macro level. Um, because I focus on national level issues, um, so it probably will be reflective a little differently in terms of what I have to say. But um, owing to the guidance provided by MPO and, and Anthony, I will stick for now to just outlining some of the key macro level challenges that we've had as a country. Bearing in mind that we only operate on 83,000 square miles with a, a population of about 750,000, which is about four square miles population density per person, which tells you that our scale and range as a country is quite small. But recognizing that over 75% of our population exists along our coastline for about 214 km. So that means that social distancing by default is also quite difficult to achieve to some extent. So that's the first issue I want to point out. And coupled with that, the issue of cultural beliefs is an attendant fact that further exacerbates the challenge of creating separation amongst people. Um, and if I were to reflect on indigenous knowledge, particularly amongst our indigenous communities, um, and I think Eileen, uh, we, we can relate that in the Canadian context to our Métis and to um, our Mi'kmaq people. So that is the equivalency in, in Guyana. And they make up a large percentage of the population, about 10%, across nine indigenous nations. So that's quite complex for a small country. And I've only just returned from conducting an assessment, assessment mission in two of the affected communities. And one of the things that came out quite strongly in that assessment is that they are not taking any precautions, really, as a, as a village, simply because they do not believe culturally that they will be affected by COVID-19. And they believe that as Amerindians, as indigenous people, they are immune to those kinds of infections. So that in itself has spiraled into behavior that is running counter to the national guidelines. And that is also existent in many parts of our, our cultural landscape, not just amongst that group, but it's more pronounced amongst that group. We also, the effects here is complex for us on a number of fronts. We share three borders in the South American continent. We share a border with Brazil in the south, and we know Brazil's cases have escalated astronomically. I mean, we only have 75 confirmed cases so far with eight deaths. So that is minuscule as compared to Brazil. Um, then we have Venezuela to the west. Now, on the Venezuelan side, we are also grappling with the influx of migrants as a result of their instability. We've adopted an open border policy to respond to the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. But as a result of COVID-19, the concerns around transborder um, transmission of, of COVID-19 would have seen us close the borders. In closing the borders now, we've had an influx of illegally landed migrants utilizing now subverted channels for entry. That means that they're no longer gonna be easily subjected to the usual screening process for COVID-19. And therefore it can potentially exacerbate our numbers. Um, and, and that's on the Venezuelan side. On the Suriname side, and, and mind you, as I would have mentioned several times in my diploma um, training is that we have an active border dispute with Venezuela. So that makes it a little more challenging to address. On the side of Suriname, we also have a border dispute. We share the quarantine river with Suriname and the, Sur the, the quarantine river therefore is considered Suriname's territory at the high water mark. So both countries kind of manage that waterway to some extent. 
what that also means is that the Surinamese and the Guyanese authorities would have implemented curfew measures in response to COVID-19. But the attendant effects is that now we have limited travel on the Quarantine River, for example. That limited travel means that we have two indigenous villages living on that Quarantine River. And their only logical and easy access to commodities, to medical services, is at the northern end of that river, which is at Corivital. The issue here is that the communities, as a result of the lockdown in Suriname and Guyana, they have not been able to traverse that river freely. Um, I'll talk about response when the opportunity comes up because that's a whole different kind of response. But so far, the community was unable to engage in their usual economic activity. But because they're cut off, they do not have much opportunities like the rest of the country to enter different cities and towns. So, you know, uh, that in itself compounds the issues. Um, the issue of comorbidities, where people are managing other chronic illnesses and diseases, has compounded um, the impacts for us as a country. So therefore, because of the low socioeconomic levels in many communities, that would then create more anxiety at the community level and has created more anxieties. It has also resulted in much more fear. Our um, call center now is receiving double the amount of calls per day because COVID-19 is creating complex iterations of what signs and symptoms are. But because of the high degrees of prevalence of comorbidity issues, many persons are making calls based on fear as well and not maybe necessarily anything to do with COVID-19. A lack of culture and safety across the country has resulted in many irresponsible acts as a spin-off effect of COVID-19. Only um, last evening, sorry, two evenings ago, our curfew starts at 6 p.m., ends at 6 a.m., but yet still our roads are packed because of that negative mindset by many persons in the population. And we've also seen an increase in traffic accidents, serious accidents, simply because the roads are a bit clearer now, later. And so speeding at the individual level is now encouraged and, and practiced in a much greater um, way. So, and the last point here is the impact has to do with the overwhelming of our, of our healthcare system, which already has very low resources. Even when we look at the number of test kits available for the entire country, testing is progressing at an extremely slow rate. But what is significant to note is that we are seeing of the tests instituted or conducted, we are seeing about a 25% positive return rate on those invested tests. That also means that there is this belief that if the expansion of that testing were to occur, then instead of seeing a flattening of the curve, we may very well see some level of spiking. Um, and the last point I wanna make in terms of challenges and impacts is that while a number of hinterland and remote communities may perhaps have some level of a natural barrier to the possibility of transmission, because there's less movement in and out, the concern is that if you, if one case enters that domain, then to manage it would be extremely difficult. And I think the impact there as well is that economic activity has been totally halted in many communities. But I think that is the trade-off in trying to manage the, the response. So I leave it there for now. Um, I, I just wanted to outline what are some of the broader um, national level um, issues and impacts of COVID-19. Thank you. Um, thanks, Salim. So uh, Jackie had raised her hand on the on the chat. So I'll hand over to Jackie, and then after that, uh, Anthony. I think you can take over. Um, 
Hi everyone. Nice to see you and talk to you again. Uh, just like others uh, in Tanzania, uh, we have a lot, a number of like uh, announced 408 cases of death, but a number of infected people. And uh, working on an organization, maybe I can I can trace back after code. Uh, me and my colleague, we have established an, a, an organization known as Gender Action Tanzania. So maybe I can speak on part of women and, ch and children, where uh, on part of women, the cases of death and the infected people is very high. But on the other side, also the uh, number of cases of uh, intimate partner violence, economic, the, because most of the women we are dealing with are those who are working um, small income generating activities. So you can see how the, the increase of numbers of people who have been affected economically and most of them being women on our side. So uh, what we're trying to do uh, now, it was part of response and some on prevention because uh, still uh, women, we are not in, in we're not aware, most of the women we are working with, we are not aware of on issue of savings, on issue of, uh, it was like working from hand to mouth. So uh, we are trying to address those challenges on how they can uh, use the little they have during this time, as even the uh, uh, business are not going as normal. Uh, however, we don't have a, a, a lockdown in our country by the government. So still people are going at work. It's based on the discretion of the employer. Yeah. So <laughs> we have like, a, 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 I mean, a police where uh, the, the current regime say just about work. So we are, people are still going at work, but the number of cases which are infected are increasing and mostly uh, women are affected. And also, uh, uh, as an organization which was newly established, we are having some uh, donors who are supporting us. So for us as an organization, it was like uh, also like a lockdown of most of the activities, most of the public activities were not allowed, but you can just walk in, in Zoom where you cannot reach your target group because most of the women cannot access technology on our country. So, what we're trying to do is ch just doing some recordings and pass it through along the, the, the street, along the community, and just pass the message on how they, they can prevent. And also we do support of the mask, especially those who are handmade mask, which you can wash and maybe you can iron, um, which maybe they are not uh, among the qualified mass under WHO instructions, but we are trying at least maybe they can save the purpose as people are still working and still looking for their daily bread to support their family. So, uh, and also what we are doing, we are supporting also the, uh, the, the, the poor families with some food and some basic needs. Though, of course, it's not sustainable because it's dependent on the on the availability of those needs depend on donors and the local uh, local sponsors, I can say. So just like other other countries, we are still struggling. We don't have lockdown so far. Uh, we are we are we're in the part of East Africa where our borders depend on. Uh, I think it's about uh, seven countries: Uganda, Kenya. They are depending on on our their lockdown countries, so they, they depend on. Tanzania. So those movements are still there. So we are still struggling and the numbers are increasing daily and there are a lot of cases which go unreported, both in terms of infection and, uh, and death. Yeah. Thank you, Paul and Anton. Thank you, uh, everybody, sorry for that. And uh, thank you, Jacqueline, for that. I hope you're not driving at the same time as you're talking, but uh, uh, 
uh, anyhow. Um, uh, uh, can I ask Eileen, uh, we're going to transition now uh, from the, uh, the, the the broader conversation around uh, impact to uh, the question about response. So I was wondering, we, we have a, a listing of some of the types of responses that we've been hearing from other um, graduates. Um, uh, so the next slide. Um, and I'll just run through these relatively quickly, if you don't mind, uh, Mpo, I'll just um, uh, do this. So there is the question around uh, COVID-19 as a humanitarian crisis, the types of issues that, um, uh, uh, that uh, Salim was talking about, but also we've seen uh, this visual is from India where the, the lockdown has really created quite a humanitarian crisis in terms of uh, uh, workers, uh, informal sector workers, having to go home from the cities and so on and some huge issues and risks in themselves. And so how is this, how is COVID-19 being framed as a humanitarian crisis with a humanitarian uh, response? So that would be one, uh, that's one set of issues. Uh, uh, a number of us have talked about how do we uh, support community-led responses to the pandemic uh, and, and their issues around health, uh, around food security is a huge issue in many countries, particularly where there's a lockdown, where there's been a, a huge swelling in uh, unemployment, uh, as, as um, Asefa mentioned. Uh, the informal sector, people not being able to go out and earn their daily bread, uh, issues of economic livelihoods. I mean, there have been different responses to that. I'll, I'll just give a, a couple of examples just to, to for, for example, we've seen a number in a number of countries, people have spoken about uh, women's uh, uh, groups uh, that normally do uh, different types of work with textiles and sewing and stuff like that, getting into the production of masks. And that, and using that as a, seeing that as a market opportunity, and and really uh, producing ma a new product line, if you will. Uh, Musola unfortunately hasn't joined us um, uh, today, but she exchanged with me by email yesterday. Uh, she was concerned about her connectivity, the work that she's doing in Zambia around fundraising for um, provision of support and services and essentials. Uh, for disadvantaged groups, in, including uh, um, women, uh, the disabled, and, and so on. Uh, let's move on. Um, yeah, okay, and that speaks to that. To something is is a in a large societal crisis here. How do you make sure that you reach uh, uh, reach the most uh, vulnerable um, and unrepresented groups? Um, uh, as I alluded to earlier on, one of the particular issues we've seen is around uh, the vulnerability in a lockdown situation, the vulnerability of women to gender-based violence or domestic violence issues, uh, issues around um, the safety and security of, of, uh, of the aged and infirmed uh, for the reasons that uh, Salim mentioned in terms of their, their greater vulnerability to the, uh, to the virus. Um, next one, please, Eileen. This, all right. Um, some uh, people have seen this. Okay, this is a learning moment. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult thing to say in the middle of a crisis, but there are issues here around how do communities respond? Uh, how do we uh, engage um, uh, with different groups? What works and what doesn't work? Um, some of the, the things people have talked about, how do we address issues of attitudes and beliefs, whether that's in terms of um, uh, as Amber, uh, you know, uh, suggested, um, people not believing in the virus or believing it's the rich man's virus and not respond to them, or as, as Selim mentioned, in terms of um, uh, traditional beliefs and, and social customs and practices. So how can we address these? And what's the most effective way of, of doing that? Um, okay, and next one, I think, is the last. Okay, and then more broadly, uh, public policy. Uh, so governments are taking a, a huge amount of space in this at, at this moment in terms of um, a public policy, both the, the lockdown itself, or whether to lockdown or not, or a selective um, shutdown types of, of support that are going out to different groups. And, uh, and so many uh, community organizations and NGOs are engaging in that, trying to point out what are some of the issues with it, trying to push the government to do more or to target more effectively or, or whatever. So there's a range of different engagements that uh, NGOs and that have done to try to uh, in, uh, engage with government and other duty bearers to try to uh, get them to respond more effectively. All right, I think that's uh, next one. Uh, oh yeah, okay, I'm sorry. And then as um, a couple of you have mentioned, our own organizations, this, this uh, lockdown, the pandemic itself, 
uh, is having a big impact on our organization. Some NGOs have had to start laying off staff because the, they can't draw down the funding if the programs aren't being implemented and the programs can't be implemented in lockdown. Uh, other ones are trying to cobble together alternative arrangements. Uh, so anyhow, it's just a, it is an issue for our organizations ourselves. And to be honest, as I said at the outset, uh, here at the Cody Institute, it, you know, if, if we can't have international students coming to the Institute, we really have to think, rethink our, our business model um, uh, moving forward or whatever. How do we, how do we deliver our programs? How do we meet our, our, uh, our vision? So these are all some of the issues. I think you can go to the next one um, that I just want, we just wanted to throw out there very quickly as some of the types of responses that we've seen organizations take or play. And so again, we would like just to open the floor um, and just see what, um, uh, what people have to offer in terms of what are your organizations doing uh, and, uh, and happy to hear again from people who've already spoken or from those who have not yet spoken to suggest or reflect on what they've been doing so far. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Mpo to manage the, uh, the, the open conversation. Um, all right, thank you so much, um, Anthony. I think when we had a conversation uh, with Salim, um, I wanted to ask him to share some of the humanitarian responses that they've been um, giving um, in, in Guyana. And because I think there are so many learnings that we can take out from there. And then once he's done, I'll open the floor to everyone else to share how they've been responding um, to issues on COVID-19. But I think firstly, from my work, so I'm currently a student, but how I've been, uh, share, I've been supporting Action Aid in Uganda, where I was previously working. So they all came to a, a, a standstill with COVID and realized we can't really continue responding to our GBV programs the same way that we're doing. Something has to change. So we're currently in the process of, of formulating new programs in response to how we're going to continue supporting women during this crisis. And it might, it most likely going to change post COVID. We're also in the process of trying to see how we're going to function and sustain the organization uh, post COVID-19. So I think those are some of the learnings that I, I, I'm hoping that we can all bring up and we take up the conversation from there. So um, I'm gonna hand over to Salim. Anthony, I see your mic is on. Do you wanna share something? <laughs> okay, um, so Salim. Yes, it, it was pretty interesting listening to some of the challenges shared. And I think there are a number of cross cutting issues that we can identify. And it's no different to what we are experiencing here in Guyana. But if I were to just add to the conversation by outlining a few um, responses that have been uh, managed from the humanitarian side. Um, the first one would be that the Civil Defense Commission of which I am a part of, our mandate is to focus on how to balance development with national response and looking at the humanitarian and the human rights aspect of some of those responses. And to do that um, in response to COVID-19, we've set up a two branches of the of the response. One is on the health aspect, which we have a health emergency operations center, and it focuses on all the public health messaging and the issues related to clinical care. And then more on the operational side, broader perspective, we have what we call the National Emergency Operations Center, and both of them feed into a national structure called the um, the National COVID-19 Task Force. At the moment, the task force is being reconfigured with the intention of focusing on, on the response from a more medium and long-term perspective. Uh, some of those plans are still being drafted at that level and will be communicated to the public shortly. We've adopted an, an approach of both bilateral private sector and multilateral partnerships in order to bring about various levels of responses. As I would have indicated, there are a number of vulnerable groups that have come under the radar for a number of reasons. And so in, in the context of the bilaterals and the multilaterals, we've been doing a lot of work with the IOM, 
the Canadian High Commission, PAHO, WHO, um, UNICEF, UNDP, and the UN system more broadly in Guyana. And as you can recognize that they, they are quite specialized agencies on a number of fronts. And one of the focus areas that they, they have taken on is the issue of migrants and addressing concerns for host communities. And they've been quite instrumental in providing a framework of operation for us where we've implemented an ecosystem called Primes, which was really in response to the Venezuelan situation, but that is also being used as a tool for documentation and tracking of some migrants. In, in, in essence, too, that has been used as a, a data mark to determine some of the vulnerabilities of migrants themselves. As part of their efforts, they are making available a number of resources, both to the Guyanese Authority, as well as communities and affected migrants themselves, recognizing that migrants become even more susceptible to the effects of COVID-19, because they're already in an unfamiliar place. They have very limited resources. And because the economy now is a bit depressed, these interventions by the international community is quite critical. Um, also, we've embarked on a, a mini stimulus through um, the packages and preparation of food hampers, recognizing that some communities food security has become a huge challenge. You know, that has been exacerbated due to job loss. Believe it or not, if I were to use my own experience at home, we're actually spending double the amount on food at home. And you tend to think when you're working, you're eating more. But apparently, our children are eating double the amount than they used to eat when they're going to school. I am not sure it's an October phenomenon. I am quite sure it seems to be much broader outside of my own home because on Facebook, we're seeing now an upsurge of home base chefs presenting their cuisine to the public. So that tells us that if the, the food security element is quite an important element. So we've started some of the work to bring relief to communities with um, the provision of food hampers. I know that there's a, a reformatting of that at the moment to better scale up and evaluate where some of the greatest need might be in communities. And so the task force is leading on that at the moment. Um, in terms of addressing concerns on this clinical side, we've had PAHO, WHO, bring in a lot of humanitarian relief, not just to central towns and cities in Guyana, but also the remote locations. They've been supporting um, those humanitarian efforts along the line of providing preventative barriers like personal protective equipment in terms of face masks, face shields, um, specialized uh, barrier devices for police and frontline workers. Um, right now, uh, I've been engaged in a process of helping to coordinate the movement of 48 prefabricated housing units that UNHCR was using in Brazil with the intention of bringing them to Guyana through the road, through the Brazilian border, which will act as a mechanism to scale up quarantine and isolation facilities. And that will bring some relief to a lot of persons who do not have the home environment because we're not promoting home isolation. And at the moment, we are promoting institutional isolation. And these are for persons who test COVID positive. So, you know, on that front, that is going to help us to scale up our ability to isolate persons in, in areas where the availability of a physical structure building is, is not possible. Um, also, the private sector and NGOs have been providing a lot of humanitarian relief in many communities. And we're, we are the commission, we are actually tracking those responses. And there is a quite a wide range and focus on food security because at this time, Due to the depressed economic state, food seems to be one of the 
most important items to deliver to communities at this time. Apart from food, hygiene and sanitation supplies at the commercial level, it's very hard to even purchase some of those things in local stores because many of them have been depleted. So the private sector, the international community, the local governments have all been providing various levels of support to provide those um, supplies. So in a nutshell, those are some key responses. I don't think it is comprehensive as yet. This is being built out iteratively, and therefore a number of gaps still exist in this regard. But those are some of the key um, needs that have been identified by communities so far. And based on what we've seen, um, they are very important steps in, in not just responding on the clinical side to the response, but looking at the socioeconomic concerns. A number of gaps, for example, persons are looking forward to see what the government is going to do in terms of stimulus packages, for example. How are we going to treat the high levels of unemployment rate, for example? How are we going to treat with many businesses that might not reopen their doors after this um, pandemic has passed? How do we balance that with the needs of both local communities and, and large-scale corporate businesses? Lastly, I want to also add that our attendant and pre prevailing political impasse where we have not finalized the, the outcomes of the March 2nd general elections, which is still a contentious issue, has also had some impact on the response and it also is having some impact in terms of how the response is strategically addressed. And it may have a number of other spiraling um, and snowballing issues, such as funding, availability of certain kinds of resources, and, and a number of other issues that one can imagine will develop as a result of our shaky political dynamics at this time. So I just want to stop there. I think that's an overarching view, but we could probably take some more with questions at the end or so. Thanks. All right, uh, thank you so much, um, Salim. So um, we have people that haven't said anything um, and I think we'd like to learn from everyone. Um, hi, worker. When we're at Koji, you were doing amazing work with SOS and young people. I think I'll, it'll be interesting to, to get your perspective on how um, a bit on how it has affected young people and the vulnerable and how you guys have been responding to it and how just a two, mi two minutes intro on how Malawi is doing and how they're, they're responding and then the work that you've been doing. Okay. Uh, um, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks, Mpo. Um, so I'll basically just um, probably just take a few, just go back a bit, um, just to explain that we only currently we have 38 cases and um, out of those, I think 10 are local transmission. So we can see that um, I think we're, we're increasing in terms of the number of, um, of cases that we're getting um, locally. However, um, we the government had declared that we were supposed to get a, to to go into lockdown, but then human rights defenders um, um, went against that and got a court injunction. Um, the the reason they did this was basically looking at um, Malawi as a country where we have over half the population that is living um, basically hand to mouth. So there were concerns on how is it that we're going to support these people who who live um, hand to mouth, where will they get food? And um, we also have, I think the other challenge that we're having is uh, COVID has been taken as a political thing. So people do not believe that it's there. And there's a lot of political um, like interference in what is going on. However, um, at SOS, what we've been doing, I'll start with SOS firstly, 
um, since we are working with issues of child protection? Um, how is it that we're going to strengthen um, the systems of child protection if should we in, um, have maybe issues of a lockdown in the offing? However, and oh yeah, in the offing. So what we've done is one of the, the challenges that most of the kids that are, are, are facing at the moment is issues of education. We've, um, because the schools have closed, um, we have children that have access um, basically to who go to private schools. They have the option of going or doing online learning. But then what about the kids that can't afford that? And those are kids in government. So what we've done as SOS, we're working with uh, child protection committees and mother groups, as well as parenting groups to see how is it that we can strengthen the parents and other members at community level to support children um, with um, like maybe additional classes or reading, things like those. How is it that we can use those structures that we already have, the libraries, the little community libraries and stuff to support our children in the, in the communities. So we've been doing um, a lot of that while of course observing issues of social distancing and, and um, maintaining um, uh, what you call, um, um, I mean, washing your hands and all those things. Um, in terms of a youth consultative forum in the youth sector, um, the youth are being used mostly to disseminate information. Um, we still have like a long way to go, especially with the fact that people do not believe that, um, that there is COVID. They, they totally and absolutely refuse that it is true and they do not believe that anyone, that, that, that it's in Malawi and the government is making it all up. So there's a lot of civic education that is um, happening. And then uh, we have a number of youth um, organizations that do um, tailoring that have joined the masks for all movement where we're sewing um, uh, masks which will be distributed to um, various communities for, for free. So those are some of the things that we're doing in Malawi. Um, all right, um, thank you so much, Wicca. Um, first, there's Cyprian on the call, but I'm not sure if you're from a diploma class. Could you introduce yourself a bit or? Uh, so my name is Cyprian, I'm from Kenya. So I've been in the Cody um, email or invites for activities that are going on. I was to be in this year's uh, 2019, 2020, women leadership uh, training. So I'm just interested to see what people are doing and that's why I'm here. Yeah, so don't really mind, they can listen. Yeah, oh, sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for, for that. Um, and then, um, so there's Nagma, Alan, Sue, Anita. Um, would you guys like to share what you've been doing or some of the lessons that you've been seeing because I can see you're online and would love to hear your voices and to pick up a few things from you guys. So just unmute your mic if you want to go first. Thank you. We can, can, can you hear us, Alan? Just a minute, uh, just a minute, just a minute. Okay. Yeah. He's got to get dressed. No, no. I think uh, my video was uh, mirrored, so I'm just trying to figure out how to mirror the video back so that you can see me straight, yeah. That's all right. We'll just pretend you're in Australia, you're upside down. It's okay. Yeah, it looked like you were defying gravity there for a while. Oh, 
Okay, so I why does Alan is yeah. trying to figure yeah. out? Okay. Yeah. So hi everybody. Hi Captain. Hi I'm Pope. Amber, Jackie, Asafa, Sam, uh, Sureni, Nagma, Veka, Anita, Brian, of course, Anthony, Gord, and Eileen. Uh, it's really nice to see all your faces after such a long time. Uh, so uh, uh, after my time in uh, Cody, after coming back, uh, as I was working as an independent consultant, I, was, uh, I registered a, a small startup of my own, and I started working for uh, human rights uh, specifically uh, with, with a lot of education institutions within my own uh, state that is Jammu and Kashmir and uh, soon after a, a brief period of time we had a, a, a state ruling uh, which uh, was a controversial ruling of this, uh, in India that was uh, uh, guarding the state's uh, land rights and citizenship rights uh, against the conflict between India and Pakistan. So ever since uh, that happened uh, we had a serious lockdown of the state and uh, many schools were shut. Uh, most of the news never came out to the global world. And uh, people who were in touch with me, even from Cody family and uh, some of my faculty members, uh, I was in touch with them and uh, giving regular updates as to what is happening. And of course, I was in touch with Naima through Facebook and my posts on what is happening. And uh, uh, so we were in a lockdown before COVID-19 itself, uh, before the co uh, lockdown was imposed on the country, which you all know, which you must have read in the news also. So we are in one of the biggest lockdowns uh, in the globe, handling 1.3 billion people of the country. And uh, it's been, uh, uh, the, the, we are entering the last week, 40 days of uh, lockdown. Uh, so as most of the points shared by Salim also, uh, is very much relevant in our context that the economy is uh, completely uh, shut down uh, because uh, uh, we don't want most of the cases, uh, uh, you know, uh, becoming victims of the COVID-19 virus. So the government has completely uh, locked down the whole country, uh, no economic activity, no gathering uh, beyond five people anywhere. Uh, families uh, are uh, uh, with their respective, uh, within their respective houses. Uh, the government is doing as much as possible uh, in terms of response, uh, but uh, the testing is completely, uh, you know, 0.2% of the total population that is being done by the government. So we really can't uh, come up with the numbers as to how many are affected uh, as, a, as a nation. So the numbers by and large, as of now, are 30,000 uh, as on today and uh, around 1,008 deaths so far. But the numbers are going to drastically go up once the testings are done, once uh, you know, the government comes up with some, some, some mechanism wherein the rapid tests are available. We had, uh, the government had uh, come up with an uh, order with uh, the Chinese government uh, with uh, 15 lakh uh, rapid testing tools, but uh, we found it defective and uh, the order was cancelled. Uh, uh, earlier uh, this week and the kits were sent back. So the government is facing those kind of challenges. And apart from that, uh, I joined the Caritas uh, organization for whom I was working in the past uh, for the strategic uh, management division as the manager. And uh, ever since I have been driving uh, the vision uh, for the Caritas uh, organization in the country, uh, which is a four year plan until 2023. So taking cue from most of the learnings that uh, I had in Cody, along with all of you. So we have this four pillars structured in the organization known as empowerment, animation, uh, dialogue, sharing communities and volunteering. So uh, driving the change of, uh, uh, you know, community development through these four pillars, we are partnered with uh, all the 174 Catholic dioceses in the country, which mounts to 174 diocesan organizations along with uh, other 60 organizations who are belonging to religious congregations and uh, other faith-based organizations in the country. So uh, along with all these partners, we are uh, trying to have this, uh, 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 you know, the four pillars as the principal uh, uh, way of approach for community development for the last eight months uh, from the time I have been uh, reinstated with Caritas. And currently we are into emergency responses. Uh, I just shared a brief video also which Eileen asked me to email and I've sent it in the group chat also if you guys can just download and see it. So we have reached to across uh, 2 million people so far uh, as a response in the last uh, 35 days. Uh, we have uh, reached out with uh, uh, dry ration that is food kits for a period of two to three weeks. Uh, the food kits are balanced uh, diet as per the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN which is a minimum requirement of uh, 2100 calories per person per day. Uh, so we have supplied food kits uh, based on family numbers to every families. 
uh, that is 2 million families. And apart from that, we've also engaged in a lot of community kitchen activities, which is one of uh, the star activities that uh, has come out as a community approach in most of the parts of the country. We have close to 138 kitchens running uh, across the country, which are completely managed by the communities. And they are serving food on a daily basis to a lot of these migrant workers and migrant laborers, daily wages, which uh, even Anthony showed in the slideshow, the migrant population were in a panic because of this pandemic uh, issue and uh, wanting to uh, you know, return back to their own houses, their respective families, because they have been working in the urban settings for quite some time because that is their livelihood. So we are reaching out to those uh, migrant laborers as well. And also with respect to hygiene kits. So we have a lot of self-help group women uh, who had a lot of, uh, you know, kind of small social enterprises running in their local uh, setup. So through the help of our partners, we have been able to supply raw materials to these women. And these women are engaged in activities of making hygiene kits like uh, soap, sanitizer, hand stitched masks and so on because the country is also facing a drastic acute uh, shock, uh, you know uh, shortage of all these materials uh, the government is not able to procure because of a high demand and when we talk about a 1.3 billion population and serving the demand of sanitizers and soaps and uh, masks to such a big population is a very big of an economic activity so in order to promote the local enterprises that is also something that caritas is uh, engaged in and apart from that, uh, we just started a week ago with a psychosocial support helpline number uh, as a part of uh, Caritas's initiative. So there is a team of uh, seven uh, uh, staff uh, from my organization and uh, I am taking care of that uh, team as well, uh, being my background with medicines and psychiatry. So we have this helpline set up and uh, the helpline is accessible to anybody across uh, the country. We have tried to rope in a lot of volunteers, volunteers, psychologists and psychiatrists across the country who could uh, support us in uh, reaching out uh, through phone calls to everybody who is uh, wanting uh, you know, the need of counseling at this time of pandemic uh, uh, stress, which is one of the things. And also uh, taking cue from what Salim was sharing about you know, the factor of eating too much. Uh, so we also have witnessed this in the communities called as binge eating. It is actually a disorder. Uh, because of the stress and uh, the, the issue that the communities are facing, uh, we tend to consume more food, but there is no physical activity with the communities because everybody's in the lockdown. So um, that is also uh, one of the uh, grave issues that we are dealing with in the psychosocial support to tell people not to panic, not to panic buy food, food materials, not to panic consume food materials, uh, because there is only... Uh, a little bit of consumption that is required on a day-to-day -day basis because they are all locked down in their respective houses with no physical activity. So we are also planning to have food banks at the family level wherein uh, the family can uh, map their everyday food consumption and uh, save on the food materials to sustain the, uh, the food materials that they have for a longer period of time for consumption. So that is something that we are working on. We are closely working with uh, Catholic Relief Services, CRS, which is a US-based uh, organization. They're working in India as well. So the technical part is supported by them. And uh, our director, our executive director, uh, has video conferencing on a bi-weekly basis with the prime minister of our country, that's Narendra Modi. And he reports uh, the work of the church as a whole uh, as to what we are doing as in, uh, for the nation uh, in this time of crisis. Uh, it is all an extreme new experience for all the development sector in India to support and uh, you know work towards this health emergency because on a day to on a daily yearly basis we face emergency responses in the country in the form of natural calamities earth, uh, you know floods uh, and uh, a lot of drought that happens throughout the different seasons but the health emergency is something new for everybody and uh, it is uh, something as a new experience even for the government of india so the government is doing as much as uh, best they can. And uh, so are we as uh, non-profit organizations to support in this entire action for uh, the COVID-19 response. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, thank you, Alan. So I was just on the chat. Uh, Sue just shared uh, something interesting on, on Fiji and how they've been handling it and how... I think it's... Uh, Sue, could you please... Uh, like give us a few minutes and share what you shared in the post in case uh, people are not uh, reading on, on the chat, if that's okay.
two. Oh, she may have trouble she's with saying, her phone. I don't know. Can you turn her on, uh, Eileen? It just sounds like she's having trouble turning on her mic. I'm, I'm trying to, and it's not working. I'm just going to continue to try. Just one second. May I suggest, uh, Mufo, that you read out the comments that she made on the uh, on the chat while I'm looking at her microphone? Okay. Um, so Sue said, in, uh, in Fiji, we're grappling with extreme weather along with COVID-19 situation. A government has acted proactively taking measures to prevent import of the virus. However, we had our index case just over a month ago. Stringent infection control protocols were launched or control-wide lockdown, including internal lockdowns, stopping all inter-island travel as well. And we had just four clusters with a total of 18 infections. We're only at cluster infection stage and not community spread. Thankfully, we have now had 12 recoveries and no death and no new infections for the past week. Um, the fear is though the... Uh, it's, it's going to hit the economy for a country like Fiji, who depends 80% 80, 80 on tourism with our borders locked, a category four cyclone just four weeks ago, and now torrential downpours. The future looks extremely bleak, even if the virus doesn't kill us, the economy effects will. So I think Fiji is taking a, a serious knock on, on the economy. So that, that's one of the interesting things that uh, I, I, uh, I wanted you guys to uh, pay attention to that uh, Sue had raised because also God had shared something interesting. God, I'm sure you can uh, unmute your mic. Shared something interesting on the stimulus packages that are being offered by developing countries. Well, I won't. I won't. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the mic to others, but I'll just say in the chat box, there's been a running uh, conversation slash debate between Salim and Fo and I on uh, on stimulus versus life support policies of government and uh, kind of jumped into it with Sue as well. You know, just uh, how I, and my, I was just typing something right now to say that in response to Salim's last post to say, I agree with them about the lack of, of coherence in some of these plans in terms of medium and long term. But I think governments are just reeling. Um, they just aren't thinking that way. They can't. They're just uh, so on their back foot, as we say. And uh, the big the big challenge will be as they start to look to the longer term, because I don't know how you're all feeling, but the intelligence that we are gathering at Cody when we're trying to consider our medium to long term is that this could go on for 12 to 18 months in terms of um, subsequent waves coming um, uh, local, not being able to ease up on social isolation, our social distancing and other public health protocols such that the economic effects may be much longer lasting. Uh, it's not going to be a, a V-shaped recovery um, where, you know, as soon as we tamp down the virus, we are able to rapidly uh, scale the economy back up, but rather the economy will be they call it the shark tooth, you know, kind of uh, recovered for a while. There's going to be ups and downs and ups and downs as, as countries and regions and cities and, you know, areas have to sort of go back down into lockdown to try to tamp back down, uh, you know, new surges. So, I, I mean, I don't know what you're feeling or how people are seeing the, the medium to longer term. Um, I agree with you, Salim, that there needs to be immediate or long-term uh, strategies once the economy starts to recover, once it's possible to open back up. And, and it may even present an opportunity to start to look at what kind of new normal, what kind of economy we want. I mean, it may be possible if we're going to have to invest in infrastructure to stimulate that it's green infrastructure, for example, rather than uh, more of traditional. So there may be some opportunities, but the degree to which governments are able to do that because of all the borrowing they've had to do just for the life support is going to be a real challenge. So anyway, there's just so many issues there. And I, I after saying I wouldn't, I would, wouldn't go on. I, I went on and on. I'm sorry. 
All right. Um, thank you, God. Um, you can join the conversation on, on the chat. Um, I'll go to Nagma and then I'll, I'll come back to, to you, Asafa. Um, Nagma. Uh, hello, hi everyone here. Uh, well, uh, sorry, my uh, camera is not working, and uh, obviously everyone knows that uh, holy month of Ramadan has been started, and we are fasting here in Pakistan. That is another challenge we are coping with, together with the COVID nineteen. Well, coming to this, uh, the update uh, by now, like uh, fifteen thousand uh, confirmed cases have been there in Pakistan, but obviously due to the lack of uh, testing kits, uh, government cannot conduct the tests so regularly. The only problem in Pakistan in regard to this uh, virus is that it is very stigma it's, uh, stigmatized, you know, it's a stigma that is attached with this virus. Because uh, the way people would uh, make videos and upload it, on uh, YouTube and all, it, it's more like uh, you are in a crime, you know, the police will come and they will uh, drag you from the houses and seal the houses. So people are really scared to even to let the peer, this, uh, the helpline or they would not go to the hospitals just because they don't want their families to be in isolation. So that is like, there are a number of uh, challenges attached to this and uh, it's uh, most, I would say, uh, like in other countries, whatever, the economy is falling down and we are in a different shape. The politics are there in regard to this. And other than that, um, I, I, our organization, we have uh, started distributing food packages. We have covered uh, almost 500 uh, families by now in KP, that is Khaber Pakhtunkhwa. But uh, obviously the funding situation is very tight over here because most of the organizations they are still thinking how they really get into because government is not allowing them for the time being and they cannot define this uh, humanitarian crisis. That's the unique kind of humanitarian crisis and the response is very difficult. We are a member of National uh, Humanitarian Network and uh, over there even people are really confused about this terminology and the response and uh, most of the people we have shared so far they are saying it's really now getting difficult because the people in pakistan they are not like uh, first of all i would say they are not ready to accept it the virus really exists and uh, they say it's a u.s made kind of a game or something like that or uh, so the people over here they are very uh, they are just acting very casual towards this response you would the government has announced uh, a smart lockdown and uh, it's not like it's a partial lockdown so people still they cannot stop people from uh, in different provinces they just come out in groups they sit there because the economy is down 50 percent of our population is under poor poverty so obviously that is another issue that really comes because people they don't know how to cope with their situations their families and all and uh, as i said that uh, there is another perception i would say that really goes around in the country that uh, in pakistan we have a very strong immune systems so because we are uh, never had anything and they think that uh, we always had different kind of diseases and all and we never had faced any major problems so our immune systems are very strong and it's, it won't happen to us so anyways like this is very difficult and we started uh, together with nhn and uh, we have contacted uh, uh, global uh, humanitarian network uh, gdrn and we have been having Skype calls from them also and meetings and all, and they are telling us the strategies, how can we go about it? Recently, we have uh, submitted a concept note to American embassy because uh, we have been partner with them since long time and we, we have been doing all the humanitarian response through them. That was basically on the shelter 
and food security. And now they wanted a concept notes that can really define, especially in regard to the women's situation. How can we access to the women? How can we really uh, help them to be safe during this time? There is one more problem in Pakistan. I mean, just a joke aside, I would say that the man, they're sitting all the time home and that is creating another challenge, which is for the women, it's very difficult to cope with. And uh, uh, we, uh, as our, an organization, we started doing all uh, uh, things that is important, like uh, spreading messages through leaflets and all, sending it to the different villages and all. But obviously that's not enough. and. Uh, the government uh, itself, they are quite confused about it. At times they would say it's a partial uh, lockdown. The other time they would say it's uh, everybody can come out. So there's so many like number of challenges that are really going around and that's the only problem we are trying to cope with. And now uh, the holy month of Ramadan has been started. So the major issue which we have spoke to embassy also, American embassy, and we told them that uh, Melt, uh, what we can observe and what we can see is the mental health problems people are having right now. They are really into getting into this frustration and fear and all those things. And that's really difficult to handle because, because of Ramazan also, they have become very frustrated and all, and you would see people fighting everywhere. And that's another issue we are trying to cope with. And we are just telling them if they can tell us how we can really cope with these things. So basically this is what it is from our side, but uh, I hope uh, that uh, next time I'll be in a position to share more details because obviously we'll, have, we'll be conducting our meetings regularly on this with the National Humanitarian Response uh, Team and Network, and they are saying that it's a unique humanitarian response and we, they even don't know how to handle. So there are strategies and discussions and everything is going on, how to handle that. So, and next time maybe I'll be in a position to give you more details. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Nagma. I saw um, Asafa has had his hand up. Um, there's Kate, uh, we haven't had anything from you. So when Asafa is done, uh, could you please say something? And then Antonio will take over after Kate. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I, I, will, I will, my points, I'll divide my points into two, one from my organization side and the other from the government side. Uh, when, when I come to uh, the government side, government is uh, doing a great job uh, to, to, to prevent the expansion of the virus. Uh, the first thing uh, is on uh, prevention. That is, uh, they are trying uh, to prevent the incoming of the virus uh, into Ethiopia. So anyone who is coming from outside into Ethiopia will be quarantined for 14 days at his own expense. So he will, after 14 days, he will be tested. And if he's free, he will live. And if he is positive, again, he will be admitted. And the Ethiopian government has closed all boundaries. And in each boundary, they have allowed, uh, I mean, the trucks uh, which carry very important items like fuel, food, and like stuff. Otherwise, other, uh, things are not allowed to, 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 to come to, to Ethiopia. And uh, the other thing which is done by uh, the government to, uh, I mean, to stop the expansion of uh, the virus is door-to-door -door testing. It is done in Addis and in Bahadar and in some other uh, parts of the country. Uh, fortunately, uh, in Awasa, where I am living, there is no a case still now. And uh, the city administration and the, the regional government is working to prevent uh, the incoming of the virus by checking each and every vehicle which is entering, I mean, to the, to the uh, regional state. They have uh, infrared uh, detective materials that most probably they are not 100% sure whether it can detect or not those who are infected with the virus. But they are using this system to, to prevent the incoming of the virus to each, to each region. Uh, 
uh, at this point, some, some regions like Tigray and Amhara, uh, before two weeks, they have restricted any movement of transport in, in the region and to other region, but they have now relaxed, but they have limited the number of uh, persons which are going to be in, in half uh, to be carried in, in, in one vehicle or public tra transport. Uh, and the other uh, important thing that the government has done, it has a stimulus package for banks. The government has allotted 15 billion bur to relax uh, creditors and even uh, it is a relief for, there is a relief for the payment of debits and interests and they have extended the payment period. For example, if you have, uh, if your agreement was for five years, I think they have extended into seven and eight years. The grace periods have extended this, this grace periods. And the other thing that the government is doing is in hygiene and sanitation. They are distributing, that is a, a protective mechanism because board has mentioned uh, in the chat before, because Ethiopia has 110 million, around 120 million people, but we have only less than 400 ventilators, most of which are not working. So the only means to, to, to save the life of uh, Ethiopians is to work on prevention. So that's why the government is giving, uh, has, has given priority on, on prevention. The other uh, priorities that the government gave is education. Uh, there is a awareness raising is given in, in every opportunity. Everybody is participating in this awareness creation, like uh, artists, uh, politicians, and so on are participating on this uh, education. And the other is uh, food support. In my previous uh, uh, point, I was talking about the unemployment. Uh, this time, uh, most, we can say most people, most people, especially in, in towns are in between uh, life and death. So considering this, this problem, the government is extending its hands uh, by providing full support. So uh, the, in, the involvement of the private sector is very, very, very high in this, in this sense. But when, when I come to my organization, as uh, we are working with the government, uh, I am a member of a task which is established at uh, uh, city uh, level, which is working in coordinating the government and the private sector. Uh, so I have a lot of experience that I share from the government as well as from other sectors. So my organization uh, has organized or formed a team. Uh, that team has uh, three groups. The first group works on hygiene and sanitation. The second group works on education, that's awareness creation. And the third group works on food security. Uh, so when, when, when we work on these three areas, we give priority and emphasis, number one, for slum areas, number two, for disabled people, number three, for women. But, uh, in, in our case, in our case, these three groups are very, very vulnerable. So our team, gives emphasis and priority for, for these uh, groups. So uh, until now, we have distributed uh, water tanks. In the city, we have distributed 400 water tanks. We have distributed sanitizers, soap, gloves, heat detectors. We have uh, hand over these uh, heat detectors, infrared heat detectors for the city administration, so that the city administration is using these uh, infrared heat detectors in bus stations and in different gates where the vehicles are coming to our side in, in different three, three directions. So uh, these are uh, some of uh, uh, the important uh, materials that we provided, distributed and given to the government. And uh, we distributed around 50,000 posters in different languages, these posters. They, they have different messages. We, 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 we prepared 50,000 copies and the small, uh, this one, in 10,000 copies. We printed these documents 
in different language like Amharic, Sidamenya, Walaite, Walaitenya, and Guragenya language. We printed this and, and distributed to the community. The, our organization, COC, has give emphasis on, on education, on education and awareness creating. And we have challenges. Uh, before you, you guys have been mentioning these uh, traditional practices uh, had a negative impact on uh, education and the other for our and for Ethiopia, uh, the, the previously in recurring conflicts has a great impact, have a great negative impact on education against the, the, the pandemic. Uh, uh, but uh, we're trying our best, especially in educating people in social distancing and uh, hand washing. Previously, we had a, a, a practice of hand washing, but uh, ha social distancing for Ethiopians is a very, a very big challenge because we have a culture of eating together, <laughs> uh, playing together, whatever. So it is, it is a big, a big challenge. But we have uh, currently we have different organizations working in uh, with us, uh, so it is very encouraging. But still, uh, our size we don't have any case in Nawasa. And compared to the population of Ethiopia, the number of cases, it is 126, it is very low. But you guys, we need your prayers. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Josefa. That was, uh, that was great. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, so let's um, uh, let's just uh, move to a, a closure there. I mean, I must admit it it is just overwhelming to uh, to hear all the different um, uh, activities that people are are up to in terms of your organizations, um, from national level to household level and everything in between, and the types of responses that you are uh, engaged in um, in this very uh, unique and and challenging time. Um, so I. Um, I, I, I think it's time to wrap, uh, wrap up the conversation. I'd like to uh, certainly thank you all for, for joining. I would very much like to encourage you, um, if you have your particular case studies or even if just a paragraph or two on what you're up to, uh, to send, uh, send them in. Um, we uh, send them into uh, to me or here at the Cody, and we're just compiling these as you see. If you look at our webpage on our COVID uh, web page, which basically started out as just what's the Cody response, but now has absolutely been taken over by all the responses from our partners through the network or whatever uh, to uh, uh, to capture that and to share that and to disseminate that and to try to make what we can of what is a very difficult time into a, a learning a learning moment and in terms of what works and in particular. Uh, what, uh, what, uh, how do we make this an asset-based, community-driven, uh, citizen-led type of uh, approach within these very uh, challenging uh, circumstances? I mean, the big issue that we're facing here at, at Cody, or the big question that we're trying to grapple with, and um, and that uh, I think uh, you know hangs over this whole conversation, is is this just a, a moment in time? Is this a particular? moment or is this a is this a tipping point is this a transformative moment in terms of um uh public policy in terms of um uh, the role of government uh, and is that a tipping point for the good or for the bad in the sense of uh, is this going to now just underline how inadequate are our health systems or how vulnerable are our education systems or our economy uh, that we that governments will be much more progressive and enlightened in terms of uh, uh, moving into the future, or on the other hand, uh, will it be that no, we've uh, we, we we absolutely emptied the uh, uh, the public treasury and trying to respond to the crisis and moving forward uh, that uh, you know that there will be no resources for or limited resources for the types of progressive social policies and that and this will have a terrible trickle down impact on NGOs and on our uh, communities and on our work. So um, anyhow, uh, it's a, a whole series of really big questions outstanding, I, we, which we will continue to try to uh, address. Um, I do want to thank you all for uh, for coming together um, at this time. It's just uh, great. Um, uh, is there something we want to wrap up with? I'm, I'm just going to say until the next time. I don't know if you recognize any of those people in that in those pictures um, from a, a 
time not so long ago. Um, and uh, uh, oh, I see you all there wearing your winter hats. Uh, well, I'll tell you, it's it snowed yesterday in Antigonish, so we we're horrified that we've got another six inches of snow on the ground, even though it's the month of April, and people were already starting to put in their uh, in their gardens. Uh, are any final words, Mpo, that you'd like to do in terms of wrapping up? Um, so I would just say it was an interesting conversation that we had and would recommend that if there are any questions or suggestions or if you want to have this and we have more content, uh, please reach out to Brianne and then if so many people are interested in having more conversations, I think it's, I'm getting available to I'm staying at home, people, so I have all the time in the world. <laughs> so it will be interesting to have those conversations and, and take them further on, maybe apart from COVID or learning, how have we been? It, it, it was nice meeting you guys, e-meeting you guys. So I think it's, it's an opportunity also to, that COVID has given us to say, well, it shouldn't have ended on graduation. How are we keeping up? How are we doing? It will be nice to have another session one of those days. Um, and also share learnings as well. So for me, it was amazing learning from you guys. I'll hand over to Anthony. All right, well, I just have nothing further to say except uh, thank you, everybody. Um, there will be a, uh, an evaluation questionnaire is always going out uh, sometime in the next day and with a link to the, um, uh, the taping of this, which will be posted. And as I said, we're gonna be trying to capturing a lot of these examples and case studies or whatever in our uh, documentation. So if you yourself have something that you'd like to share with us that's written, uh, we're, we'd love to, uh, love to hear from you. So anyhow, everybody take care, uh, all the best, uh, stay healthy and um, yeah. And uh, a special thank you to Eileen and Kate for, for, for backing us up technically. It actually went quite well. And, uh, and apart from Sereni and uh, Sue and Alan appearing upside down on occasion, uh, it was all good. So thanks a lot, everybody. Take care. Thank you all. Have a good one. Thank hey, you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.